Our long flight is finally over. We're arriving in Lima, spending the night, and tomorrow we're heading for Nazca. They usually recommend tourists to visit the district of Miraflores, where there are modern hotels. It's near the airport, but we've decided to spice things up and settled in the old part of the town, in a house built during the colonial times. There's even a small private museum here. The owner of this skull is likely to know something about the secrets that we are going to reveal. Now we are going along the Pan American Highway, the Pacific Ocean on our right, and we have about 400 kilometers to cover. A cold current of Humboldt runs along the Pacific coast, and it determines the climate that reigns on the coast. This is a fairly steady temperature, between 15 and 30 degrees. And if there are seasonal climate differences in Lima, there aren't any in the place we're going to. It's a quite pleasant, comfortable summer. It might rain from January to March, but in very modest amounts. Basically, Nazca is considered to be one of the driest places on Earth. The cold ocean current mist towering over the ocean crawls along the lowlands, along the gentle slopes of the hills, and creates such an image, unusual for the Midland residents. Here is the first geoglyph. It's modern, though, and very convenient. Seen from afar and has been well maintained in this climate for quite a long time. Actually, such work can be seen in modern Peru very often. And those are chicken coops, beach ones. Chicken, along with potatoes, is one of the basic foods in Peru. We've decided to drop in on the peninsula of Paracas, but got a little lost. Finally comes the solemn moment. We're going up the plateau. It's even on the road signs.
We are on the viewing tower at the height of about 15 meters, facing the plateau, the official name of which is Pampa San Jose, known as the Nazca Plateau or Desert. It is here that the tourists first get to know geoglyphs. Let's not break the tradition and have a look at the geoglyphs from here. This place has the highest density of geoglyphs per unit of area. It's about 20 kilometers to the city of Nazca from here. The plateau itself has an area of just over 300 square kilometers. But this is not the only place where these geoglyphs can be seen. Lines like the ones in Nazca can be seen near the town of Pisco, near the Paracas Peninsula, 200 kilometers north, and 50 kilometers south of Nazca, in the mountains, at a height of 2,000 meters. At this height, it's difficult to have a look at anything. But nevertheless, you can see clearly a huge strip with piles of stone around it. You can also see the paw of a giant 200-meter-high lizard, which was damaged greatly during the construction of the Pan American Highway. If you look to the west, in the direction of the Pacific Ocean, you can have a good look at the huge group of geoglyphs. Strange as it is, there are no schemes, and the guides do not tell about what tourists see from the tower. A detailed plan of this geoglyph was done a long time ago. It's a very curious group of lines, which brings together the so-called trapezoid, reduced triangle which is connected to these lines, and three unique patterns. We've seen part of one of them, the lizard, and the other two are very interesting. They are called the tree and hands. We will talk about them later. And if you have a look at the map, it's seen clearly that the whole combination of all these lines was drawn as a whole. That is, the builders knew perfectly well what should be there and where it should be. Moreover, the trapezoid, the zigzag leaving the latter, and the tree are drawn with a continuous line, narrowing towards the end. The total length of the line is more than five kilometers. That is, there was a significant land surveying and plain physical activity of cleaning stones off the surface. Now we are moving to the next observation point, and I think we can talk about the history of discovery of this phenomenon. Rumor has it that it was Pedro Cieza de Leon who mentioned Nazca lines for the first time in the Spanish chronicles of the 16th century, when he traveled around these places at the beginning of the Spanish conquest. He described Inca roads passing through valleys and deserts, and literally wrote the following, that there were trial markers somewhere amidst sands to guess the paved path. It should be noted that he knew about Inca roads and was likely to have just them in mind. And, as we can see, there is no sand here, only rocky surface, with a large and chaotic jumble of lines more likely to mislead the traveler than to point to the right direction. There is a point, better informed in my opinion, that these lines were first discovered at a height, with the start of regular flights between Lima and Arequipa. Well, be that as it may, 1927 is the date of the official discovery of Nazca lines, when they were first described by Peruvian archaeologist Toribio Meja Hesepe. In 1939, they fell under notice of Paul Kosak, an American who heard about these lines at the archaeological conference in Lima and began to deal with them directly. He was the first to hire a plane to make high-quality images, which were then shown to the whole world. Another momentous event happened in 1940, Paul Kosak hired Maria Reiki as an interpreter. 
She was born in Germany, studied maths and geography there, and settled in a hut on the edge of the plateau in 1940. She dedicated the rest of her life to studying these ancient figures. She covered the construction of that tower, where we had our first observation. She also hired guides at her own expense in the tourist boom periods. Her studies are still considered the most reliable. She has awards from the Peruvian government. And thanks to her, the Nazca Lines are now listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Geoglyphs have risen to international fame after the release of books and films by the famous German author and paleocontact advocate Erik von Daniken in the 1970s. Geoglyphs became known as landing strips for alien ships, which literally caused the tourist boom, a huge inrush of tourists who, unfortunately, inflicted serious damage to the desert and the very ancient signs. We are now at the second observation point. It is a group of mounds near the Pan American Highway. Tourists are rarely brought to this place, but you can easily get here with a private vehicle. This place is interesting because you can get closer to the geoglyphs to take a close look. This place meant the world to the ancient builders, who used it when marking their figures. When trying to call the sketch map to mind, despite all the apparent chaos, the ancients did have a certain construction regularities. They used a fairly limited number of elements, such as trapezoids or truncated triangles, large rectangles, stripes, or lines to draw zigzags, or which were simply drawn on long distances, including figures and spirals, which could be identified as a separate category since they had similar functions. We already know a great combination of geoglyphs, which were examined from the observation tower. Well, it is not the only combination of such a nature. Similar groups of lines are fairly common. The well-known monkey, which is often used as one of the symbols of the tourist business in Peru, is part of a great combination of lines, including a trapezoid, zigzag, figure, and even a spiral-shaped monkey tail. And all this is a single, continuous line. The desert has a lot of different combinations, with lines connected to trapezoids, groups of lines combined into larger units. There are also the so-called line centers. These are the points which have multiple lines coming from them. There are several dozens of known points, with us standing on one such very large center. As you can see, we have here a large number of quite long lines stretching over several kilometers. This is how the desert surface looks like at close range. These are reddish-brown, slightly toxic colored stones with a desert patina overlying the subsoil layer which consists of a mixture of sand, clay, and gypsum, almost dust. Geoglyphs were built with fair ease. Stones were simply pushed aside or carried to the boundaries of large areas, thus exposing the subsoil layer, which was almost white in a fresh state. However, was not widespread, with different methods resorted to as a function of the surface, as will be further shown. This mound gives rise to the line, which merits detailed consideration. In the 1970s, 
the astronomer and professor Gerald Hawkins, who conducted research here, pointed out that the geometrical accuracy of construction of geoglyphs was above the photometric capabilities that existed at the time being. And it should be noted, it was not a bad result for the ancients. And now, this line confirms Hawking's findings. This 10-kilometer line is clearly visible on satellite maps. And when you create a link between the tangent points using a straight line, you will see that the deviation of our straight line from the ancient line will not exceed 1.5 meters. It can be argued that it is almost a perfect line. A perfect straight line. And these deviations are quite likely to occur due to survey error of the satellite, which might have not been located exactly above the line. It should also be noted that a quarter of this line passes through a quite challenging terrain. Why are the Nazca geoglyphs considered one of the unsolved mysteries of history? And what makes them unsolvable? First and foremost, it is their unique straightness. Accuracy of geometrical shapes, unusually large dimensions, and enormous number. If you look at the geoglyphs on the satellite map, or none the worse, take a look at the plateau at a height, you will be stricken by an extraordinary surreal picture. Vast stripes diverging in multiple directions, lines fleeing to the horizon. All this looks like some kind of alien intervention. As if someone slashed the desert to pieces with an unusual weapon or some huge tool. There is a good comparison that the desert is kind of ruled with a giant hand resembling a chalkboard at the end of a geometry lesson. An important point is worth mentioning. Many researchers, and I generally agree with them, come to the conclusion that the geoglyphs were not built to be viewed from the ground, rather to be viewed at a height for a better perception. We will keep coming back to this point, but I guess you may have noticed another point already. When we viewed the geoglyphs from the ground, from observation points, all of this does not look so impressive. Here on the plateau, the surface is flat, but on surfaces, having some small bumps and more challenging terrain, the geoglyphs are perceived only if you are standing exactly on the boundary with a straight line clearly visible from this spot. But if you step a little bit aside, an almost perfectly straight line turns into some pile of stones, into a muck pile, and simply disappears in rough terrain. And if it is a great combination of lines or a giant figure, we cannot even figure out what exactly is depicted on the desert surface which makes it absolutely necessary for us to climb to a specific altitude. Currently, there is no doubt that the geoglyphs were applied during the time of the Nazca culture, somewhere between 400 BC and 800 AD. They were a people of a fairly low level of social development. They had neither writing nor a centralized state, not even a formed elite. They had common ceremonial centers, but used to live in separate tribes and villages isolated farmsteads, with shaman leaders in the lead. Valleys could not nourish everybody and their brother. But as Maria Reiki wrote, judging by a copious amount of work spent on geoglyphs, sketching huge figures must have been one of the overriding priorities of this culture. At the same time, however, 
there is neither a single reference nor a hint associated with the geoglyphs on pottery, textile, or any artifacts at all. Especially worth mentioning are figures, which are relatively few compared to the tens of thousands of lines and trapezoids. Plots from some of them can be found on the items of the Nazca culture. In the meanwhile, they are totally different from the style of figures on pottery and fabrics and have a kind of purely modern touch. Back in her day, Maria Reiki worked hard to determine how it was that the ancients managed to draw such accurate, beautiful, smooth curves that resemble the work of a modern graphic designer. It should be noted that it was necessary not only to make a sketch, but also to move and turn this figure into a huge image, sometimes even a gigantic one. The largest group of figures is 400 meters long. In general, the figure matter is the most interesting, in my opinion. It carries a lot of surprises, and we will dwell on it in detail. There is more to come. In the early 90s, a figure completely different from those revealed earlier was found between the Nazca Plateau and a small town of Palpa. The difference is that other construction methods were used in this case. The figure itself represents a combination of points with squares, circles of different diameters. These figures do not have any specific name so I call them geometric constructions. In academic circles, they are considered later fakes, but as it turned out, there is more than a dozen of them in the plateau area, even perhaps a greater number. And I promise, we do expect very interesting surprises here. It is quite natural to talk about the purposes, options, hypotheses to explain the purpose of geoglyphs. There is a vast number of various versions and hypotheses, but I think now we need to note two diametrically opposite points of view, having all these theories in between them. The first point is a man-induced impact of some extraterrestrial civilizations, as mentioned by von Daniken. But, it seems to me, a certain abdication of responsibility, unwillingness to learn the authentic history is seen here. In this way, we pass on all these extraordinary phenomena to some fantastic factor, which is way beyond our understanding, and then we can talk about anything you want. On the other hand, under the pretense of some point of view of academic science, in popular films and articles, we are told that the mystery had been solved long ago, deciphered so that there was no mystery. In between fighting for life and cutting off one another's heads in these arid areas, Nazca did have a very developed trophy head cult, primitive tribes dealt with applied geometry and made such amazing rituals, which always resulted in different geometric figures, flawless patterns, only visible at great height. I think it is better to talk a little bit later about versions and hypotheses of the purpose. When we get ourselves familiar with the material, view the geoglyphs at a height, and tread the ground near them. We are very close to Nazca, and I have something more to tell you at last. The surface the ancient figures were applied to is very, very different in different places. Here around Nazca, it has a very delicate texture. 
One person is certainly unlikely to immediately cause any significant damage, with strong wind quickly smoothing out any tracks of one person. But a group of people, especially those traveling by bike or any motor vehicle, does leave tracks that will be self-sustaining due to strong winds, and such tracks will remain there forever, like those tracks we have already seen from the observation tower, which are clearly visible at a height and on satellite maps. A very significant damage was caused by the construction of the Pan American Highway, passing through the area of dense accumulation of geoglyphs. Nowadays, the plateau is a protected area, with entrance punishable with a very high fine. But, as we already know, lines can be found in the coastal zone with a total area of 10,000 square kilometers. All this area cannot be effectively protected. Therefore, geoglyphs gradually disappear, fall under development and agricultural land uses. There is certainly a blunder in the Peruvian government, for example. The route of the world-famous Dakar Rally was laid exactly through the ancient geoglyph, one of the largest. It was done by Palpa, 20 kilometers away from the plateau, with very serious damage caused to the geoglyph. Yet, it is quite difficult to blame people, since geoglyphs are hardly visible on the ground. There is research that needs to be conducted in each specific case and, as a consequence, the geoglyphs are slowly but surely disappearing. This is clearly seen when comparing satellite maps for different periods. Well, finally, we enter Nazca. This is a small provincial town, which even by the standards of Peru, is somewhere very deep in the wilderness, and hardly anybody would know about it if it had not been for these huge signs. Life is quite inexpensive here. There is the internet, comfortable hotels, in general, everything that is necessary for the frugal traveler. Now, we're going down the main street, and the roadsides have bus stops, as I had thought. But in fact, there is no public transport at all, with people moving around on such small cabs here. And these are just stylized awnings over benches. This is a central area, and we are going to check into one of the hotels of this town where we will have our headquarters, from where we will make our trips.